Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the Roaring Twenties. So when you say that, what, it, it conjures up to me Art Deco and the Charleston. But I'm talking about the Roaring Twenty Twenties, which for me conjures up images of the decade of full fibre. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. But I'm going to start off at the beginning, because if you look at the internet technologies, they seem to fit quite nicely into the decade. So let's go back to when Zen started in 1995, the decade of dial-up. And this was our very original core network, six modems, a couple of Linux boxes, a router, IKEA wooden shelf, opened our doors and called ourselves an ISP. Um, and in the 90s, the internet was very niche. So by the end of the decade in 1999, only 13% of the UK, of UK households had, had access to the internet. There was no smartphones. Of course, that came in the next decade, so still a very niche thing. So move forward to the next decade, the, the decade of the 2000s. Some of you will recognize this uh, consumer ADSL router. And ADSL launched in 2000, and by the end of the decade, um, was nearly 80% of all broadband connections, so 14.5 million ADSL connections. So that was the 2000s decade. Then we move on to the 2010s. So I would say that's the decade of FTTC. Um, this graph shows the various technologies, the decline in ADSL. FTTC itself was launched in January 2010. And by the end of the decade, about 50% of all fixed broadband was FTTT. And that was, that was growing, so 13.4 million connections. Cable grew slowly, so cable grew by 30% over the decade, um, but actually as a proportion of total connections in the UK that went from about 19 million to about 27 million, um, as a proportion it shrank by a couple of percent. And ultra fast, so full fibre and a bit of GFAST in there, was just getting started. So that moves me on to the 2020s, the decade of full fiber, and a very interesting decade, I think. So first of all, the biggest player in the full fiber game is OpenReach. Um, OpenReach have just got to about six million premises passed with full fiber now. The aspiration is to get to 25 million by 2026. So thank you, Clive, for that. Um, how are they doing? Well, I thought it'd be worth just having a look at the build rate over the last year. So the build rate over the last year, 2.3 million, are they building fast enough to get to that 25 million goal? So if you extrapolate that out, then you'll get to about 18 million by December 2026, which actually I think is, is pretty impressive um, when you consider what they're actually doing, but not quite fast enough to meet the target. So they're going to have to notch up. Actually, not massively, but a little bit. In terms of take-up of FTTP, so again, back to uh, just sticking on open reach for the time being, this is the take-up graph. Uh, so of those 6 million premises passed, 1.3 million circuits were live at the end of September, so take-up of 22%. And that represents about 5% of the UK's total of 27.5 million fixed broadband connections. So lots going on uh, from open reach. Um, and if I'm talking about full fibre, I need to talk about the other established infrastructure player in the UK, Virgin Media O2. And so what are they doing on full fibre? Well, as of July, they had 1.2 million FTTP live. Um, but one thing I think that's particularly interesting with uh, with Virgin is the DOCSIS 3.1 upgrade, which is giving you a 1.1 gigabit download, a 52 megabit upload over the L cable TV networks. Um, and that upgrade started about two and a half years ago in Southampton and has been going through to the point where at the end of next month, the entire Virgin network will be upgraded to, to DOCSIS uh, 3.1. 
and, and that's 14.3 million premises. So if you add that to the 1.2 FTTP that are built already, that's a total of 15.5 million premises and growing that will have access to gigabit broadband. Okay, it's not gigabit upstream, but it's gigabit um, downstream. And that will make Virgin the UK's largest gigabit broadband fo footprint provider for probably about the next couple of years. Now, if OpenReach achieve their goal to get to 25 million, then it will overtake Virgin in terms of gigabit connectivity sometime, I think, in about 2024. Now, Virgin is, is, is keen to get more out of its cable network. Um, so there have been three trials already of 2.2 gig DOCSIS 3.1. Uh, the first trial had an upload of 214 megs. The second two were, were just a 50 meg upgrade um, as well. And actually, DOCSIS theoretically is capable of, uh, of up to 10 gig download and 2 gig upstream. So actually, th th there's, still, there's still lots of mileage left in the old cable TV network, but Virgin recognizes that long-term fiber is the way forwards. So they have set a target of 2028 to replace all the cable TV, all the DOCSIS stuff with FTTP. So that's where we are in terms of the two um, established infrastructure providers. And let's jump forward. So, so if, if the 2020s is the decade of full fiber, well, what's the 2030s going to be the decade of, or, or the 2040s or the 2050s? And of course, it's, they're going to be the decade of a hell of a lot of thing. You know, technology is going out of pace fast, as, as fast or faster than ever. I did a talk here a couple of years ago on AI, and I think there's, there's lots of things we can look forward to um, from that perspective. But in terms of infrastructure, I think that the 2020s will be the last major infrastructure rollout in, in all of our lifetimes. And the reason for that is really simple, of course, because once you've got the fiber in the ground, the upgrade path is, is effectively unlimited by just putting different kit on, on each end of the fiber. For, so from a gig to 10 gig, 100 gig, 400 gig, beyond, um, you can continue to, to make those upgrades. That means that if you want to be in the full fiber game, you, be, you better get in now. I think there's a window of opportunity of probably the next five years that if you're going to build a full fiber network, you, get a, you better get a lot of it built in round about the next five years. Otherwise, you're going to miss the boat. And of course, a lot of the alt nets um, are, are, very, um, are very aware of this. And so what's happened is, is something that I'm calling the alt net gold rush, where companies across the UK are trying to build absolutely as much full fiber as they can with the promise of big rewards. Um, Mark Jackson from ISP Review has painstakingly put together a, a compilation of all the different altnets. And I was quite surprised that there are, there are about 100 on his list, from some quite tiny ones to actually some with, with, with pretty big ambitions. And it reminds me of the late 90s, the early 2000s, when the internet was new. And you know, it was every other week there was another ISP popping up. And there were loads of them. And you know, going back to by uh, my boat analogy, it reminds me of the BT si sailing challenge, which happened in summer 2002, when you know BT corporate jollies were somewhat more, somewhat more grand than maybe they are today. Um, and there was a whole flotilla of yachts with just loads of people from loads of different ISPs, and we spent two days so sailing around the Solon, which was which was a lot of fun. But the thing that I remember is the number of different ISPs that were involved in this particular event, and it feels a bit like that with the altnets today. And in terms of the coverage of the altnets, so th this is from a report done by Point Topic on behalf of the Independent Networks Cooperative Association, and, and it excludes OpenReach and Virgin Media O2. So by the, by the end of last year, there were estimated to be 2.6 million premises passed by those circa 100 altnets. And of those, about 800,000 customer connections. The survey asked the altnets, well, how much are you going to build by the end of this year? The survey was done, done in May. Um, and they said, well, yeah, we think we'll fit 
we'll be passing 6.6 .6 million premises. We'll have just over a million connections. And there's a bit of a health warning here because, um, it, first, it, first of all, it's very aspirational. And secondly, it doesn't account for overbuild. And of course, with all these altnets, there's increasing pressure of, of all overbuild from, from other altnets and from um, OpenReach and Virgin. And they were also asked, well, where do you think you'll be at the end of 2025? Um, and, and then you know, the graph gets even bigger. So nearly 30 million premises passed. Obviously, a lot overbuild not taken into account, and there'll be lots of overbuild. Consider that there's only about 31 million premises in the whole of the UK, um, and 6.2 million customer connections. So very aspirational. And, but you know, very exciting. It's a gold rush after all. After all. And there's a huge amount of money um, being ploughed into this. So planned expenditure on CapEx between 2020 and the end of 2025, 10.8 billion pounds, according to this report. Um, so lots of people are obviously seeing the opportunity that if they can get in, there is an opportunity to make uh, a killing. Or, or not. I mean, who are they, the altnets? Uh, well, I'm not going to go through the whole list of the 100. And, but these are the top five in terms of the current footprint. So actually, City Fibre last week announced that they've just passed a million premises. Hyperoptic uh, are, are their second with uh, about two thirds of a million. Community Fibre, just over 300,000. And then G Network and GigaClear, about a quarter of a million each. But I think it's quite interesting this in terms of what, what the different focus is of the different altnets here. So City Fibre have a very very much a nationwide strategy. Um, but they do, they're not doing very much in London, actually. Most, most of it is outside of London. Hyperoptic, focusing on big, uh, big, big office blocks, apartments. Community Fibre and G Network are both London-based. Their focus is completely within London. Um, and GigaClear, um, completely focused on, on rural communities. So, so actually, they're, they're all quite complementary with each other. In terms of future aspirations, Gig City Fiber want to get to 8 million, and if Greg Mesh has his way, he'll go higher than that. And Hyperoptic, 5 million. Community Fiber, 1 million by end of 2023. 1.4 million for G Network, and um, over half a million for GigaClear. And, and, and the aspirations from the others um, are a lot of them have big aspirations. You know, a million, half a million. Four million, one of them has an aspiration to get to four million. They've not actually built anything yet, but the aspiration's there, and the money's there, and actually a lot of the expertise is there too. And that moves me on to the great altnet gamble, because if you're building an altnet, you are taking uh, quite a gamble. And I think that if you are building an altnet, I can see three strategies and three possible outcomes. The first one is get big. So this is definitely City Fibre's approach. The next one is get bought. And if I think back to the 2000s, all these ISPs that were popping up, and then through the 2000s, a lot of them got gobbled up um, by, uh, until we were at 2010. And certainly beyond that, there was a small fraction um, of ISPs. And in fact, far too few for BT to lay on any sort of jolly <laughs> with them, because it, other than quite an intimate, intimate one. So there's, there's definitely an opportunity for these altnets to get bought up, to, to consolidate, and then of course the investors, the founders, will do very well. Thank you very much. But the third option, or the third outcome, is to get stranded. Um, and this, I think, will definitely happen to some of them. So they'll put a lot of funding into building a network. They won't necessarily have the that many customers on that network, and then it gets overbuilt by, uh, by, or overbuilt by say, OpenReach, or one of the other altnets, maybe, maybe City Fiber. And then what value is there in that infrastructure when, when, it, when it's niche there, and probably you know, not the value that has been paid for. So that is the gamble that the altnets are taking from, from what I can see. Then I'm going to move on to this, what I'm calling the scale problem. But before I, before I touch on that, I, I just want to talk about actually the dilemma of business models. So there are three possible business models that an altnet can have. One is wholesale. So this is City Fibre's view. We want to focus on our core business, which is building an infrastructure. 
and we want the ISPs to do the whole end user interaction. Um, that's fine. Other option is retail only. So this is where you build a network and you don't wholesale it, you're going to sell directly to end users. And actually, that works really well if you've got a captive market. So GigaClear did really well with this model by building into the rural communities, and they were the only choice in town. You know, if you wanted 50 meg symmetric, that was GigaClear, or you could stick with your, you know, your half meg ADSL from OpenReach. Um, but of course, as the overbuilds and upgrades come along, that is a business model that potentially could be strained. Uh, and then there's the option to do both, you know, do wholesale and retail, and some of the alternates are doing that as well. And then you've got the challenge that, well, you know, is that spreading myself too thinly for, you know, in some cases, some alternates are quite small businesses. So it is a dilemma. It's not a dilemma for all of them. Some of them are very clear on the strategy. I know, talking to some of them, that it is a dilemma that they're juggling with. Um, the other part of the dilemma, of course, between retail and wholesale, if they do retail, they get more margin. Yes, it's more effort. Wholesale, they get less margin. So I'm going to move back now to the scale problem. And just give an example, and, 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 and this, uh, this sort of really happened, but I won't name who it was. So Altnet comes along, knocks on our door, in Rochdale, hey Zen, we're a great alt net. You know, we, we, we've got 10,000 or 20,000 premises passed, but you know, we're going to build to X number, which is a lot bigger than that. So, how about signing up as a wholesale customer and being a retail ISP? You've got, you've got a known brand. And the problem with this proposition is onboarding as an ISP, onboarding a new infrastructure provider is a lot of work. You know, we've got to make commercial and service relationships, we've got to integrate with their API, we've got to build new products, we need processes for, um, for upgrades, regrades, cancellations, faults. You know, so there's a lot of work there, and there's, there's got to be sort of minimum opportunity to make all that work worthwhile. And with, you know, let's say 10 or 20,000 premises passed, you know, what realistically could Zen win in terms of end user customers, you know, 5% of that, maybe, we'd, do, we'd be doing pretty well, 10% max. So you're talking about maybe 500, 1,000, 2,000 customers. And is it, all, is it worth all that onboarding effort, f let's say, for another 1,000 customers? And, and, and the answer for us is, is, it's just not worth our while, commercially, to do that. Now, I know I, I, spoke, I was speaking to a CEO of a, quite a well-known ISP, um, fairly recently and and they had a different view you know they were quite you know much more ready to onboard with lots of little alt nets to try and maximize the opportunity from an end customer point of view so this is just zen's view really not everybody's view but i thought worth sharing so that's a bit a, a sort of whirlwind tour of, of alt nets themselves and then so what's zen going to do about it and as an ISP, and in particular, what are we going to do from, a, from an infrastructure perspective? Well, first of all, we're not going to join the gold rush. We're not going to start laying our own fiber. We'll leave that gold rush to everybody else and focus what, on what we're good at, which is, which is being an ISP. Um, we have a project that we call internally the Journey to 700, which has nothing to do with my partner or this road in Chile, um, but is actually to do with building to 700 exchanges around the UK. Um, we've got 451 live today, providing on net service. We've ordered the other 249, and as of a couple of days ago, we've got 81 racks um, delivered uh, to date. Our, our goal is that by the end of this financial year, which is September for Zen, will have that project completed. What that will allow us to do is connect into at least 80% of um, OpenReach's FTCP footprint on our own network and 100% of, lo of locally connected on net footprint for City Fiber, uh, who is our other partner. So in terms of partnering with ISPs, these are the two infrastructure providers that we've chosen so far um, from, the, from the list of 100. At this point, 
Um, I want to take a complete off tangent to something completely different, which is AI. Um, and I was, I was here actually two and a half years ago at Lynx 105 uh, talking about when AI becomes super intelligent. And one of the things that I, um, I showed back then was a, a survey of 352 AI researchers who were asked, you know, when do you think certain milestones will be passed in terms of AI? And one of the things was, when will I, AI drive a truck? And the average view of, of quite a widespread, it has to be said, was by 2027. And, and I thought, OK, let, let's see if there's an update here. And the, th the thing that piqued my interest was a news release about a month ago that Tesla were uh, releasing in the US um, their full self-driving beta to, the, to, to drivers with a perfect safety score, 100 out of 100, over the last 100 miles. They want the beta testers to be the safest drivers. And I thought, you know, is this a milestone towards that 27 goal of having cars driving themselves. Um, and this is what I found, you know, are, are we a step closer to self-driving cars? Well, the Society of Automotive Engineers have come up with a, 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 a six categories of self-driving cars, zero to six. Um, and the left three, you are the driver all the time. The middle one, level three, is a bit odd because it's sort of this hybrid that, well, actually the car's the driver a lot of the time, but if it gets into trouble, you've got to step in and take over the controls. Um, and level four and level five, this is a, the nirvana for self-driving cars where the, the car is really driving itself. And in fact, at level four and level five, you don't actually need a steering wheel or pedals because the car will never ask you to take over at level four and level five. So where's Tesla's? Self-driving beta, oh, it's, at, um, it's at level two. So despite being called full self-driving, actually you are the driver all the time. <laughs> so a bit of a misnomer there. Um, as I said, level four and level five is where it, it really is at with self-driving. And, and, and the difference here, so level four, the car drives itself all the time, but in a limited set of circumstances. So the route might be limited. Maybe it can only do it in good weather, what other ever. All the, all the factors have to be right. And level five is the car can drive any route under any conditions, so the absolute nirvana. So in fact, the conclusion, I suppose, back to the question, are we a step closer to self-driving cars? Well, Tesla's calling it full self-driving is an absolute misnomer because it is not full self-driving. It is. A, a clever driving assist with you as being the driver. So a bit less exciting than it sounds like. Uh, having said that, it is still really, really impressive what they've done. And you, you shouldn't, I suppose you shouldn't take that away from them, despite the hype. My own opinion, I think level five by 2027, very optimistic. I think we've got a long way to, to go for that. But level four by 2027, so full self-driving in a limited set of routes, limited set of conditions. I think that is a, a possibility with the way the technology is going. Anyway, so I thought I'd just do that little AI interlude because it's something that interests me greatly. I, I want to finish off going back to Zen strategy, and this time not looking at infrastructure, but looking at our purpose. So the human race is on an unsustainable path. And it's not just the climate, which we're hearing a lot about now, but the well-being of society, and in particular, the obscene amount of inequality in the world. And this is one of the most potent examples for me of that inequality, that twen the 26 richest per people in the world today own the same amount of wealth as half of the rest of the human race. There's a, there's a lot of focus at the moment with COP26 on governments fixing the climate problem, but actually, my opinion in it is, yes, they've got a big part to play, but I believe businesses and the people in this room have got at least as, as big a part to play in fixing the problem as the governments have got. And in fact, it's clear to me that governments alone, not only will they will not fix the problem, but even if they really, really wanted to, which actually, you know, a lot of them do, they cannot fix the problem 
alone. You know, bus businesses have a, a key role to play. So with that in mind, I'm thinking, well, 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 how can I get Zen to be part of the solution to these issues? Um, and, and my goal for Zen is that we set an example of how to run a business, how a business can, can be run sustainably for the well-being of society and the, the long-term sustainability of the environment. And some of the things that we're doing, first of all, our most fundamental long-term objective. So what's the, what's the purpose of Zen as an organization? And, and it's encapsulated in these three very simple priorities, happy staff, happy customers, happy suppliers. It creates a environment where people come first and money second. You know, money's super important, but it's subservient to people. It's subservient to our environmental goals. We're a B Corp, so we're a part of a worldwide network of about uh, over 3,000 organizations now that are all about using business as a force for good. And we've had to update our articles of association to give me and my fellow directors a legal responsibility to do good for the environment, to do good for society. We report on that annually. We're carbon neutral plus. We've committed to becoming net zero by 2028 and ideally sooner than that. And we continue to work with, uh, uh, with, with, with organizations in the local community. So this is what we're trying to do. And I want to finish off with, um, I, I suppose, a dream and ambition of mine for the future, which is just in my head in the, at the moment, which I'm thinking, well, we're doing all this stuff at Zen, but what about taking that wider? You know, what about other businesses? And I have an ambition and, and an intention to set up a charitable foundation, the Zen Foundation. And the idea of the Zen Foundation is to create an ecosystem within which businesses that are like-minded and have similar views can prosper, can grow in a sustainable way. Um, so my sort of thinking is it will be a bit like a private equity business, but that never exits any of its holdings. So that's the sort of dream, that's the ambition. It's just all PowerPoint and reports at the moment. But hopefully, if I come back to speak at links in a year or two's time, I can talk about something that's real and talk about some more details of how it's going. So that's everything from me. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? <laughs>